Next. <clears throat> It's my pleasure to introduce Jan Chu, um, who's an assistant professor at MGH in Harvard Medical School, uh, and also an associate member here at the Broad. And he's going to tell us about decoding cell fates through single cell genomics, imaging, and machine learning. OK, thank you. Um, can, can everyone hear me well? OK, so thanks for, for the can, kind uh, introduction. Also, thanks for Melina and Casper for the uh, uh, invitation. And I'll be uh, very happy to share some of the um, ongoing work that we've been doing in the lab. Um, my lab is interested in developing platform technologies to um, really decode the uh, cell phase and reprogram the cell phase. In order to do this, we need new genotyping methods. We also need new phenotyping uh, technologies that are scalable and cheaper and probably you can do at the organoid uh, 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 scale at the you know, deep tissues. And we also need um, new uh, combinatorial perturbation technologies that can bring the genotype phenotype together. And of course, we need to work on the new, you know, more complex and disease uh, relevant model systems. Um, and, and I would like to start with a thank you because um, I did my postdoc with Eric uh, at the Bro, and then some of the work that I'm gonna share today is actually uh, uh, um, related to the work that I did uh, as a postdoc, and also like the collaborators that I had over the years. Um, and also, of course, the lab members, and, and they're brave enough to join a new lab during pandemic, and, and also of the funding source. Um, today, I think I'm gonna share with you with three um, sto uh, small stories about how we think about decoding the cell fates. And the, the first one is gonna be a very brief introduction and, and, and how we can and, and decode the genotype, for example, in a complex uh, iPSL village or uh, uh, primary tissues. And then the second one is gonna be the main course, and then I'm gonna introduce um, something I think it is super cool to uh, really think about how we do genotype, or like a phenotyping through different kinds of uh, imaging methods. And then the third one is uh, actually a, 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 a perturbation. How can we uh, add the perturbations and using imaging omics to read out the perturbation effect? Um, so the first one uh, about the genotyping, uh, uh, how do we decode the genotype? Um, this is a very uh, initial pilot study that we just started together with Manina and Ray, and it was supported by the Bro, uh, Spark program. The idea is um, how can we decode the complex uh, cell villages if we make you know, uh, 20 different iPS cells and mix them together, how do you know which donor is from where, and then uh, especially in the spatial context. So the solution for here is that if we have a mixture of different kind of you know, iPS cells or primary cells, and we mix them together, but they have a natural genetic variance, and then how, this is how we think about using uh, targeted in situ sequencing to read out all those uh, genetic variants, and then you can deconvolute uh, the donors. So this is a very initial, uh, 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 experiment that we showed that if you just mix the four different iPSL lines um, together and then design iPSL specific probes and we can target those probes through uh, targeted in situ sequencing and you can actually read out the different kind of uh, donors in the mixed uh, uh, population. So this shows you that um, the four different iPSL lines mixed in together and we can actually uh, demultiplex these different donors in a pooled setting in spatial contact. So that's a very brief appetizer that, that how we can think about <laughs> using uh, targeted in situ sequencing to read out the genotypes. Um, but the next thing is about multimodal phenotyping, and I think this is going to be the main course. I hope you will like it. Um, the fundamental question we ask is uh, how do we actually map the cell phenotypes? Uh, I know that here at the Bro, we love sequencing. When I was a poster, I did so many single cell RNA seq, uh, and 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 and. But there are pros and cons of different kind of phenotyping methods. But cells were actually discovered or, you know, defined originally through microscopy. Uh, it was discovered by Robert Hooke uh, in 1665. They look under the microscope. The cells look like this shape. Maybe that's a different you know, species or like a different uh, cell identity. So as I mentioned, there are pros and cons of each of these different kind of measurement. Um, and single cell sequencing is super cool, but it's still very, very expensive. And one of the fundamental limitations for sequencing is that it's destructive, which means that once you sequence it, you won't have the same cells. You cannot do this in vivo or in the human, right? I cannot imagine how can we get the single cell RNA-seq out of the brain every day. Um, but 
that's why we start to think about what are the other measurements that can complement, provide complementary information to uh, single cell sequencing. And then we started to look at imaging. Um, so the advantage of doing imaging um, and can be it's still, it can be very cheap and, and high throughput. Um, and then I think the biggest advantage of doing imaging is the non-destructive nature because uh, lots of the imaging methods that we're gonna share today, these are uh, label-free or uh, non-destructive, which means that you can apply this to live cells. You can watch them over time. You can also potentially apply this to human and in the in vivo settings. So that's why our solution is, seems very simple, just combine them two together. But how we're gonna combine this is through the recent advancements in, in, in generative AI. So how can we use multimodal data integration and translation methods to integrate or translate the different kind of data modalities? Um, there are a lot of exciting uh, achievements or breakthroughs in the computer science uh, field. And the first of which um, I think we, we, we have to mention, this is the ImageNet that Dr. Fifili at Stanford um, they get together a large collection of different kind of images from the internet, and then it teaches computer to recognize what is a dog, what is a cat. You can imagine we can do similar things to teach, teach computer to recognize what is a neuron, what is a fibroblast. And then the recent advance by DeepMind um, the, uh, the, uh, at Google, um, they also teach computer to recognize or reconstruct the protein structures from the protein sequence. And then even more recently, OpenAI's DALI, um, they, they, they develop a methods that you can actually recreate or generate the pictures from just text. So what do they have in common, all of these three different kind of you know, examples? They're a classical you know, multimodal translation uh, um, problems. In the first case, that we're trying to teach the computer or translate the labels, um, or translate the Im information from images into labels. In the second case, uh, we're, we're trying to, not we, uh, but like people are trying to uh, uh, translate the sequence data into the structure data. And then in the third case, people are trying to translate the text information into the image information. But both the sequence and the structure are describing the same cells, and the text and the images are describing the same information. So we ask the same question. If we have you know, imaging data, and we have single cell sequencing data, can we build a model to translate this different kind of measurement it seems very straightforward, but you know, like, like everybody would say, it seems straightforward, but it's actually very, very difficult. Because um, single cell sequencing is extremely high dimensional. It has 20,000 genes. However, on the other side, most of the image measurement, it's low dimension. I think if you think about the best microscopy or like the fluorescent microscopy, uh, you know, you can find in Boston area, maybe you can measure five colors. Or then if you get a better ones, you can measure six six colors, but that's the maximum dimensions you can get from microscopy. So that's why we need to think about, in order to generate this super high dimensional gene expression data, what kind of you know, input data we need. That's why we need to think about the high dimensional measurement uh, as an input. Um, and, and fortunately, we had a wonderful collaboration uh, with Aviv, um, previously at the Bro, and then now at the Genentech, um, um, we developed one of the first methods uh, um, to predict single cell RNA-seq from imaging measurement using a specialized microscopy method called the Raman, spectro um, Raman uh, uh, spectroscopy or Raman microscopy. Um, the advantage of doing Raman imaging is that it's a high dimensional measurement. Imagine that in the fluorescent microscopy world that you can measure five colors, but Raman will give you a thousand colors. Those are like a pseudo colors that will give you a thousand features, which are still mystery. We don't know how to interpret those features. But at each pixel, you got a 1,000 dimensions. If you think about at the single cell or spatial transcriptomics data, you have X, Y spatial coordinates. You also have Z, which is the gene expression. So the gene expression in, you know, in the spatial transcriptomics context could be 20,000, but in the in the, in the Raman microscopy data, we get roughly 1,000. So that's the, so far like the best, like highest dimension we can get from any uh, microscopy uh, uh, measurement. So what is the uh, Raman microscopy? It belongs to a um, category of uh, image methods that people in physics or in chemistry 
are using, it's called the chemical imaging. It measures the um, interactions between light and the matter. So it would be a composite measurement that gives you the fingerprint or biochemical fingerprints or profiles of different kinds of molecules inside of cell that include you know, lipid, um, protein, nuclear acid, or different kinds of molecules inside of a cell. Um, but the problem is that it will give you a spectrum like this. Um, it will give you like a spectrum like this. We know some you know, features, but most of them we actually don't know what does mean. You will get like a just profile like this. Um, the idea behind this is that since this is high dimensional, maybe it somehow correlates with the gene expression. So that's why we uh, uh, work with uh, uh, Aviv um, and develop this Raman to RNA methods. Uh, let me just walk you through how the Raman to RNA works. Uh, first, uh, we use this. Uh, we use the uh, mouse model, uh, mouse iPSL reprogramming um, as a model system that we started the cells as fibroblast, and then we reprogrammed them all the way to iPSLs. And during my postdoc with Eric, we did a lot of single cell sequencing, so we have the rich single cell time series data already. Then we started to look, if we have this reprogramming process, let's just take some pictures during this process using this like Raman microscopy uh, measurement. And at the same time, we did some single molecule fish to measure the marker genes of different cell types, and then we correlate the Raman images with the single molecule fish data, which will measure the marker genes of different major cell lineages emerged during iPSL reprogramming. And then we build a, a, a fully connected neural nets to connect the Raman images with a single molecule fish, and then use a, t a, a um, computational model called Tangram developed by Aviv to connect the single molecule fish data with the single cell RNA-seq data. And then you can have a fully connected model to connect the Raman images to the single cell RNA-seq data. So this is the first iteration how we use the Raman to RNA uh, to, to demonstrate that you can actually connect uh, Raman images with the single cell RNA-seq. But in the latest version that uh, we started with this single molecule fish, but it turns out that we don't need to do the single molecule fish and then just put the input as the Raman images, the output will be the single cell RNA-seq because you can somehow integrate them in the latent space because they share the same structure or same distribution of cell types during the reprogramming process. So that's the Raman to RNA. And then, uh, okay, let's go to the next slide. Can somebody help me to move to the next slide? Good. Oh, okay, okay. Yes. So let me just like show you some of the results from the Raman to RNA. In the first two plots, the first one is the uh, force directed layout embedding of the Raman data. And then the second picture shows you the, uh, the embed, like a force direct layout uh, visualization of the single cell RNA seq data. So you can see that they share some shape. Um, and between these two different measurements. And then in figure D, we shows you that the predicted, predicted gene expression versus the ground truth measure the gene expression. And then later on, we show you that the, the generated single cell RNA-seq data with the ground truth. They show pretty similar. And then the last figure shows you the, uh, the pairwise uh, cosine similarity comparison between the generated uh, IP, uh, generated the single cell RNA-seq data with the ground truth of single cell RNA-seq data. So that's the first you know, iteration. How do we generate expensive single cell RNA-seq data from low cost or ideally non-destructive measurement? However, that we started to uh, work on these questions and then people uh, uh, in the lab and then they, they start to ask, can we actually do the reverse directions? If you have a single cell RNA-seq data, can you generate the pictures? And intuitively, I was like, why do we even need to do that if you already have this rich information about the cell state, about the molecular mechanisms of a single cell RNA-seq? And I started to talk with those um, uh, clinical people in, you know, in, the, in the pathology department that if we gave them a UMAP of single cell RNA-seq data, they don't know how to interpret the results. 
So it's kind of like we speak different kind of languages. So how do we translate the measurement into a language that different people can understand? So that's the motivation we started to work on the new methods, which we hope that we will put it online in maybe like one or two weeks. Um, it's called Jinvenchi. And the idea is that if you have a single cell RNA-seq data, can we build a generative models to generate the different kinds of cellular images? But the idea is that, um, also like the argument is that, maybe the cellular morphology data is already encoded in the single cell RNA-seq data, but we just never look at it um, in a way that if you just simply look at the gene expression embedding, you won't be able to see those features. But those features are actually embedded in the single cell gene expression already. We just need to figure out a way to reconstruct or review this hidden information. That's why we started to work on this Jinvenchi uh, to, 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 to uh, generate different kind of cellular images from the single cell RNA-seq data so that different kind of audience that they can use their favorite, you know, uh, language to interpret the data. Um, and then Jinvenchi can do many, many things. So let me just walk you through. The input would be different kind of single cell, spatial transcriptomics, or even patch seq, which measures the morphology of the neurons as an input. And then we build a, uh, we get the embeddings from this gene expression through a pre-trained transformers. And then you added like a generative uh, model using uh, stable diffusion. At that time, that was the best uh, when we started to work on this. But this field moves so fast, and then, and then the specific model you're gonna use, um, it can really change, uh, and it depends on your task. And then the downstream uh, output or the task that, that the Jinvenchi can do is to generate different kinds of cellular images, such as the histology images, uh, DAPI images, immunofluorescent images, or even the neural morphologies at the single cell multi-cell and the whole tissue level. And you can also do other things like uh, flow, uh, few, shot, uh, few shot annotations, just input the single cell RNA-seq and tell the program, and then they're gonna annotate, oh, this is a neuron, this is a, this is a cardio, uh, like a fibroblast. So let me just show you some of these pictures, right? <laughs> and the pictures will tell you uh, uh, more information than my presentation. Um, the first column is the ground truth. Um, and then all the other five columns are the gener generative, generated cellular images. We ne this model never sees this ground truth when we put into the model. So in the, in the first column, that's the ground truth images. And then in the, in the next five columns, we put in single cell gene expression, but the model never sees the ground truth pictures of those corresponding uh, um, pictures of the single cell gene expression, but it can generate this different kind of you know, pictures based on pre-trained uh, model. So the first one shows you the HE staining at the single cell level, and then the second one shows you the, uh, shows us the, um, uh, the DAPI stainings uh, um, and that the model can generate. And then the third one is the immunofluorescent uh, staining, and then this is the electron microscopy uh, images uh, generated from single cell RNA-seq. And then the last one is the neuron morphology uh, generated from single cell RNA-seq. And then that's just at the single cell level. And then we can also expand this to multi-cell or even the whole slide, the tissue level, that you can generate a, you know, single cell murfish uh, HE stainings or like even different kind of cells with neighbors. And then here, this shows you at the whole slide level. So this is just the very, very beginning how we think about you can recreate some of the information from different measurements that we never uh, had a chance to measure. Because in most of the clinical settings, if, you do, if, you, if you've done single cell RNA-seq, and then I always ask my clinical collaborator, can we do some HE staining? They told me that, I'm sorry, the samples are gone. We don't have that samples anymore. And, and especially for clinical samples, those are very precious. So I think this will give us an, an opportunity to recreate a virtual representation of a physical cell through different kinds of measurement. Um, so that's just the Genvenchi, and then I, I don't know whether you follow the you know, pop news, and, and a few weeks ago, OpenAI released a super popular, I think it is a cool uh, uh, application, it's called Sora. Um, and so OpenAI's Sora is a, G, is a text to video generator. So what DALI does is to generate the pictures from text, but what Sora does is to generate videos from text. 
But what's the difference between videos and you know, images? Videos are images plus time. So if we add the time information into the gene expression or single cell RNA-seq, can we recreate a video of you know, cell development? So for example, this is a prompt that I tried on Runway, which is an open source, and, and then you just type in an early embryo development and then it's gonna generate a video. Of course, this is not realistic. This is a super early you know, stage. Um, but the idea is that if we have time series of single cell RNA-seq data, can we use the similar ideas to recreate a video of cell development? And fortunately, when I was a postdoc, we already collected all this time series of single cell RNA-seq data from the uh, uh, single, uh, IPSL reprogramming process. So we're working on um, the GenVenture 2 to generate the videos from the time series single cell RNA-seq. And, and hopefully uh, we can share this uh, soon. But the idea is that how can we use this kind of generative models to build a virtual cell that can mimic or you can, you can build like a virtual stimulator uh, for, the vir uh, for the physical cells. So that's the main course and then the main directions that, and also the main uh, research that we do in the lab. And then, and then the, the last uh, like maybe five minutes, I will give you a very brief um, 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 introduction or maybe like a dessert uh, about how we can add the perturbations to all of these methods that we talk about today. Um, this arranged with a, a very uh, 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 wonderful collaboration with my long-term collaborator, Dr. Wei Ming. Uh, he's a professor at Columbia University, also inventors of lots of these super cool uh, imaging methods which I've never heard of before. Um, and, and then recently, uh, uh, they published a paper uh, called Vibrant. This is the first application using infrared imaging to measure the drug responses. So the idea is that you treat the cells with, uh, with different kind of uh, 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 small molecule drugs and you read out, you read out the cellular uh, phenotypes through infrared images, uh, infrared imaging. But what is, the, you know, just a little bit refresher on the uh, different kinds of chemical imaging methods. Previously I talked about the Raman to RNA that the Raman microscopy is the one type of imaging method that you can measure uh, you know, up to 1,000 pseudo colors uh, and, and, and in a label free and non-destructive measure. Um, but the problem for Raman imaging is that it's extremely slow. And it's too slow that I'd rather just <laughs> do the single cell sequencing. So we need to figure out, you know, but it's non-destructive. It's a perfect example that how we can really, really push this. But of course, there will people, they will build better Raman microscopy, make it faster, high throughput. Um, but on the other hand, there are already some other imaging methods which measures similar uh, uh, biochemical profiles like Raman, but it's way much faster. This type of imaging method is called infrared imaging. So it also measures the uh, different kinds of lipid, proteins, nucleic acid, um, in a, in a non-destructive or label-free manner, but this is extremely fast. Uh, we just started to do uh, some of this infrared imaging, for example, to image the whole mouse brain, or like one slice, it's only 10 minutes. And then the running cost is basically a couple coffees that you can you need to give it to the students so that they can you know, do the experiment. Um, and, and, and we don't need to do any staining at all. So then that connects to my previous work when I was a postdoc. If you wanted to understand the drug response or if you wanted to understand the perturbation effects, um, how do we actually do that at the single cell resolution, right? So imagine that this is the previous work that I had with, uh, when I was a postdoc with Eric, that we were trying to reconstruct the time trajectories through single cell snapshots. So you, you wanted to model the distribution changes over time from, from single cell snapshots. So we developed this method called Waddington OT. OT stands for optimal transport. So the idea is that how do you connect the different distributions over time or over different you know, conditions or perturbations. But the idea here is that we further implemented this idea of using Optimal transport, we developed this method called drug OT, but it's a temporary name, we don't know what we're gonna name this. But the idea is, if we combine the chemical imaging with optimal transport, you have different you know, perturbations, um, and, and, and then you measure the perturbation effect through high dimensional, non-destructive, label-free chemical imaging. And you use optimal transport to connect 
the perturbation effect at the single cell resolution to the different kind of perturbation. So we tested this with 19 different drugs. So this plot shows you the predicted response uh, versus the ground truth. Um, and then this plot shows you that how we can you know, really model this with, we tested, it on we tested this on 19 different drugs. Uh, and we're working on genetic perturbations right now uh, uh, together with phones uh, morph library. Um, and then we also use the two different chemical imaging methods. Uh, the first one, as I mentioned, is the infrared imaging, and then the second one is uh, Rama images. Um, this plot, I think it is the most interesting plot and also one of the last of, uh, slides, is you can actually model the uh, mechanisms of actions. You can see that, for example, in the first plot here, um, the drugs with similar functions or they somehow correlated with the different pathways they show different spectrum profiles if you added these drugs into the cells. Um, so it's similar to single cell sequencing, right? So you will group the perturbations based on the single cell gene expression. You can also group the drug perturbations based on the spectrum profiles. Um, and, and so with this drug OT, we can use this to understand the chemical you know, profiles and then the mechanism of actions of drugs. So, in summary, why are we doing this? Because if you think about the um, fluorescent imaging, it's five colors. But if you think about the chemical imaging, it's up to 1,000 different features. Lots of these features, we don't know what it means. Also, this is label-free, non-destructive, and extremely cheap. Um, to combine this strength in chemical imaging and single-cell sequencing, we hope that we can achieve both scalability and information, and then use generative AI to generate different kinds of sequencing data from imaging, and then you can add this with perturbation. To summarize the three different stories, the first one, we can use the spatial variance seek to map the genetic variance in space. And then the second one is how we can use some of these new um, imaging methods and then generative AI to generate different kinds of omics information to better characterize the cellular uh, phenotypes. And the third is how can we combine perturbations with different kinds of you know, genotyping, phenotyping methods so that you can learn the fun variant to function. So in, 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 in the future, I hope that, with, this is a picture that I found it from, from internet that Jason Huang from NVIDIA, he envisioned that, that, that you can probably build a you know, universal translator for everything. But for us, can we actually build a Google translator for biology? So thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Jan. Um, really, fun. Yeah, really great talk. Did you wear that leather jacket and an homage to Jensen Huang? Oh, I didn't. No, it's sorry. Totally <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess I can I can take the first question. So, so I'm a little bit curious about this generative model for generating images from um, RNA. Yeah. Can you look and see what RNA features the model pays attention to? for any given image or yeah. like for any given image feature? Is there yeah. some way of learning yes. something about the connection between yes, yes, yes. That's morphology? A, that's a, and yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, um, we don't know the answer yet uh, because this is very early stage. And then we looked around and see how other people do this, but it seems like there's not that many benchmark that we can even do. So um, and, and I think to learn the, you know, what kind of imaging features play importance in, uh, what kind of genomics features are more strongly associated with the imaging features, that's something that we need to work on, but we haven't had the chance to really look at that in detail yet. The uh, Gen uh, Vinci application is really neat. How do you convey like the uncertainty in the model output? Because you know things like chat GPT will yeah. always give you yeah. some answer. And, yeah. Yeah. and I guess related to that, um, how, how convincing are the outputs to pathologists? Yeah. You know, because we th you think about that, that uh, text video you showed, if you look at it closely, you can see there are some like weird yes. things yes. about it. Yes, yes, totally, absolutely. We're not saying this will replace you know, HG staining. This is, if you have single cell RNA-seq and then you don't have the HG staining, what else you can do, right? And then with this diffusion, a stable diffusion model, it's a generative model, so you basically generate a distribution. So you recreate all the possibilities that these images might look like. So uh, that's what most of the generative AI model does. So it provides, recreate a distribution. Um, 
to add the certainty there, I think the biggest challenge that, that we are facing right now is the lack of really good paired data. Um, and, and we really struggle to, 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 to really generalize this across many, many you know, tissue types. So can I pick up on the same point? Because yeah. I think both of the previous questions yeah. asked it. Let me ask it very directly. Yeah. You showed some withheld pictures of cells. Yes. And you showed generative models of cells. Why, like, how do we know they're right yes. or good? Yes. You didn't show any comparison to truth. Yes, yes, So yes. what was the ground truth comparison? How did you do it? And how do we know that they're more than just, you know, interesting videos of somebody walking through yes. Tokyo, which is a low standard, rather yes. than, you know, truly reconstructing the H&E of the cell that was RNA profiled? Yes, that's a fantastic question. So for this and then for, for you know, just a visualization perspective, I only show the qualitative pictures, but we also did a quantitative measurement to see the generative pictures, how, they are, how similar they are to the ground truth pictures using a score that people use in GAN that's called FID. So there's a quantitative matrix to measure the similarities between the generative pictures with the ground truth pictures. And? And then the... No, no, no. So, so the point <laughs> is you're saying, I did a metric, yes. but I'm yeah. not showing it. And yeah. I'm, it I'm not showing like how much closer it was yes. to cells that were this close in RNA. Yes. So my suggestion, Jen, is actually, don't just show pictures that kind of look interesting. If there's a quantitative analysis yes. of how well they match A as opposed to B, C, and D, yes. it's super important to go into that. Yes, yes. Good. The, the, the FID for this generative is around like 0 0.2, so that's the, uh, the answer. And I don't think anybody knows what's going Yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, Todd. Oh, Todd. Mike to Todd. Uh, it's still on this theme, it's such a cool idea to be able to try to translate from images to gene expression. I could imagine you could get a lot of the gene expression prediction wrong yes. and still distinguish a neuron from a fibroblast. Yes, yes. And so you probably don't need much data to be able to do that yes. reasonably well. But if the bar was higher, yes. and you really wanted to you know, predict the entirety uh, or translate to the entirety of, of a gene expression program, what, what do you think the scale of, of a training data set would look like? So in the original Raman to RNA, we collected around um, 20,000-ish cells from the Raman images. And I fully agree with you that, that I show you the generative uh, profile of iPS cells versus the ground truth iPS cells from top 2,000 highly variable genes. So if you look at that bulk level, that looks pretty decent. But if you go down to the individual genes, I don't think we're at the stage that, you know, as accurate as what AlphaFold can do. Um, and, 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 and in terms of how, how much data we need, um, I think, I, I actually don't know the answer. <laughs> and, 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 uh, but from this 20,000 profiles from Raman, we got to the bulk level. And then I would assume that maybe if we get at the, you know, 100,000 to like a million, you know, paired single cell sequencing data with different kinds of image measurement, that we can start to think about what is the, you know, accuracy that with this kind of scale of data that can provide. Yeah. Thank you. This is super early stage, and then and then just look for feedback. Yeah. Thank you. Let's thank Dan again. Thank um, let's let's take a coffee break to eleven fifteen. Yes, eleven fifteen. <laughs>